Good morning. Uh, this is my first time in front of a room of so many lawyers. So. Um, I want to start by really saying thank you so much for such a kind and generous introduction. And congratulations to you, Ana Luisa. Thank you for such an inspiring speech. What a way to start the day. So thank you. And to you, Bill, thank you so much for your service. And um, Ayla is really leading because of the folks in front of us and certainly the folks in the room. So thank you to all of you for having me here today. I want to start by telling you a little bit about myself and how I ended up in Las Vegas. People ask me often, how did a young woman from Miami end up as a state senator in Las Vegas? And the answer is pretty simple. It's my Cuban mother. <laughs> as I was getting ready to graduate from college, I uh, really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to make a difference, but I wasn't sure what that could look like or what was even possible. And so I took a radical turn and decided to join the Peace Corps. I was, yeah, ooh, yeah Peace Corps fans. Um, <laughs> um, my mom was not really sure that I would follow through on my expedited acceptance to be in Tanzania that September. And because I am a little stubborn, as she pushed against it, uh, I became more and more entrenched. And I now know that what she was doing was actively moving an organizing campaign. And it began with an email. Mimi, so she calls me, so sad you won't make it home for Christmas this year. Tanzania is 12,000 something miles away from Miami. And on a Peace Corps salary, I'm not sure you'll afford the ticket. So that was sad. The second step came two weeks later with an email titled, watch this immediately, all caps, 100 exclamation points. <laughs> and the content seemed fairly innocent. It was a YouTube link. And once I clicked on it, I realized it was a Discovery Channel episode titled Killer Ants. <laughs> two, <laughs> two of the three of the world species of ants that can eat you from the outside in are in rural Tanzania. <laughs> so that was terrifying. But the kicker came when I went home for Easter that year and she said, you know, if anything were to happen to your grandparents, it would really be a shame if you weren't home. <laughs> Cuban, Cuban mother guilt is a real thing. So I didn't go to Tanzania. Instead, I ended up in Las Vegas working on Senator Reid's reelection campaign. Didn't look good for him that summer. He was down 20 points. And I thought a campaign was the right amount of time to buy myself some space to answer the question, what are you going to do when you grow up? And Las Vegas seemed OK. It just so happened that September, my grandfather got pancreatic cancer. And the only reason I was able to say goodbye was because I was in Las Vegas and not Tanzania. I don't know about you all, but I believe in signs, and I believe that the universe kind of lets you know when you're in the right place at the right time. And that was that moment for me. I felt like I was meant to be in Las Vegas. I'm the daughter of Cuban immigrants. And my abuelos were both. <laughs> my abuelos were both political prisoners. One was captive for seven years and the other for 11 years. My abas, my abuelas, came to this country with little more than their kids in tow. I'm the first person in my family to actually be born in the United States. I really am their dream manifested, and I take on that responsibility quite seriously. Neither one of my parents had the opportunity to attend college. And despite that, they worked really hard to make a good life for our family. And I think about my abas a lot. I think about what it was like for them to come to this country. I think about the struggles they endured. I think about the things they learned. And it's really their story that is the foundation of who I am. And like me, every one of you in this room can probably point to the catalyst that started the domino effect that got you to where you are today, that made you decide to take on immigration law instead of another path. And because of the work you do, 
it's very likely that there is someone, if not many people out there, who think of you when they think of that catalyst in their life. The work you do really touches lives. Because whether it's a deportation you stopped, or a family that was reunited through a visa process, you really are shaping the fabric of this country. And if you don't believe me, if that sounds too generous, you need to look no further than the 2,500 naturalized Las Vegans that started their process last year. And it, yeah. And it would not have, happen, have happened were it not for AILA lawyers, many of whom are in this room today. And there's a story there. It starts with immigrant workers and Donald Trump. Good story. <laughs> in December of 2015, the workers at the Trump Las Vegas Hotel won a union election. It was a big deal. I was working as the political director of the Culinary Union, the union that had now won the right to represent those workers. I was intimately involved with the campaign, and to say that it was inspiring would be an understatement. Because let me tell you a little bit about what it's like to be a housekeeper in Las Vegas, which is the largest um, classification across the strip and downtown. If you work at a union hotel, you're likely an immigrant woman. The majority of Las Vegas housekeepers are immigrant women. And if you are fortunate enough to have a union, you have very little um, in terms of job scarcity. You know that you're going to have your job the next day because you have a union contract that guarantees you zero dollar out of pocket health care, a pension, and guaranteed wage increases. It's a job that allows you to have a middle class life. If you were a housekeeper across the street at Donald Trump's Las Vegas Hotel at the time, you were making three dollars less an hour. You were paying about $440 for the same health care. You had a 401k that you may or may not have been able to afford to invest in. And you had no idea if you were going to show up to work the next day and be fired. It was literally a tale of two cities across the Las Vegas Strip. And it was those housekeepers, those immigrant women, who led the workers at the Trump Hotel to their victory. They picked a fight with one of the world's most powerful individuals, a presidential candidate at the time, and they won. And it was because of their courage that we were inspired to theme 2016, the year of the immigrant worker. We knew it would be a tremendous political cycle across the country, but especially in Nevada. And as the political director, it was my job to figure out what that meant. So I got creative and aggressive. We decided to help 2,500 people apply for naturalization between February and May with the hopes that they'd be able to vote in November. We'd register 7,500 people to vote. We would get an immigrant candidate elected to Congress, and we'd mobilize voters across the state. No big deal. <laughs> From the beginning, it was clear the most difficult part of the program would be phase one. How could we get 2,500 people to apply for naturalization in three months? It never would have happened without deep collaboration and absolutely not without the Nevada AILA chapter. There's really no other way to say it. They were rock stars. Organizers from various local groups distributed information about citizenship fairs, and suddenly there were leaflets at Latino markets, across the valley, sitting in um, casino employee dining rooms, and the outreach worked. We were inundated with phone calls of people asking questions, what documents do I need, how do I prepare, and certainly a lot of people with fear. And at every step of the way, we had AILA lawyers participating. Massive attendance at our citizenship fairs wouldn't have mattered if we didn't have the legal expertise to successfully carry out each application. At the citizenship fairs, AILA lawyers were reviewing applications, and sometimes they'd even decide to take on pro bono cases without being asked when it was clear an individual couldn't be helped that day. 
They signed up for multiple shifts and ended up working entire Saturdays to help people through the process. One of the most remarkable things that occurred was when AILA attorneys trained non-immigration attorneys on how to fill out N-400 applications so we could grow our capacity at fairs. It was tremendous. And as a result, we met our goal. We increased the amount of applications that quarter by 54%. And yes, we're still dealing with the backlog. But it was a really solid testament to what authentic partnerships can look like. I tell that story because it's an example of what's possible when people come together with really ambitious goals. I really think those kinds of collaborations are the recipe for success. And when the stakes are high, we have to come together. And let's be real. The stakes could not be higher for immigrants in this country. And we've heard a lot about it this morning. ICE agents are detaining people at courthouses. Senate Bill 4, which I hope all of you fill out your postcard and send it to Governor Abbott, uh, functionally legitimizes the racial profiling of immigrants. And when people went to the Capitol to protest, a legislator called ICE. The travel ban targeting Muslim visitors is still very much in place and being used to hold people back from visas. Dreamers have been detained for deportation. And visa applications are being delayed under the guise of extreme vetting. And I could go on and on. In fact, each of you could probably come up with an example. I'm not saying anything you don't already know. But in all of these, there's a common thread. And it's not the vilification of immigrants, although certainly that's part of it. The common thread is you. Immigration lawyers, your staff, and organizations like AILA are at the front lines of challenging these awful incidents. You're taking on racist policies and fighting back one case at a time. And I'm here to say two things. First and foremost, thank you. Thank you for moving your conference next year out of Texas. <laughs> Thank you on behalf of every family who today gets to eat dinner together instead of being torn apart by a senseless deportation. Thank you from every international business owner and employee who today gets to add to our economy. Thank you on behalf of everyone who has been inspired by your work at airports, courthouses, information centers, detention centers, the gratitude is truly endless. But I have another thing to say, and it's probably the more important. And it's this, do not stop. What do I mean by that? What does that look like? It means getting to know the activist groups in your community organizing around these issues. Because no matter where you live, there are groups fighting to protect immigrant families. And in partnering with groups like these, you can truly become indispensable allies to each other. A group with deep community ties can hold a protest outside of a detention center. They can mobilize phone calls to ICE, start an online petition, really elevate the profile of cases and make sure that it's the community that fights with you to keep an individual at home. And it's what's happened across the country and I'll highlight one example. Jose Luis Ronquillo, he lives in Michigan and he's been in Ann Arbor for almost 20 years. He is the father of two US citizen sons and in 2014 he was granted a stay of deportation. When he went to check in with ICE agents this April, he was held for deportation and prepared, was preparing to leave the country. But his community wasn't going to take that quietly. And his sons, along with his family, partnered with an organization called By Any Means Necessary. They bussed people to the federal building in Detroit with signs saying, keep families together and don't deport dads. 
And with that work and legal expertise, today, Jose Luis is in Michigan with his family and has been granted a stay of deportation. And while certainly there's continued action, it's a victory for him and his family. Second is, I think it means sharing your expertise. The same groups that can highlight these egregious holes in the system need your help. As a senator, I'm now a member of the Nevada Hispanic Caucus, which is bigger than it's ever been, and I'm very proud of that. A few months ago, immigrant community leaders reached out to us and they let us know the real fear that they were hearing from the community. Lots of questions, things that I'm sure you all get phone calls about at least on a weekly basis. So we decided to host a Know Your Rights Forum. I suspect that many of you have participated in events like these. And not only did ALA lawyers like you show up to make sure that people had the answers they needed to feel safe, but they also helped train volunteers to do basic screenings and basic Know Your Rights question and answer sessions so that the work could multiply. And it was tremendously impactful. What really happens when these kinds of collaborations happen, when you're willing to share your expertise, is you cast a proverbial rock into the water and the ripples are endless. They allow for the work to really carry on exponentially. And so I urge you to share your expertise. And the last thing I'll say about what I think this moment needs from you is for you to talk to your state and local policymakers. If you don't do this already, I strongly, strongly encourage you to reach out. And I would not be saying this were it not for the fact that I have kind of unexpectedly become a politician. Maybe in your community there's notario fraud that needs to be dealt with. Maybe the wait times for basic services for immigrant workers are being held up. Whatever the issue is, you have expertise that can help shape and inform policy. Not only as witnesses and as expert testimony, but as drafters of the legislation. This session, my first, I introduced a sanctuary state bill, and it would not have happened were it not for local immigration attorneys and local immigration law scholars working with me to draft the bill. And it's because, I mean, unfortunately, because of the political moment we're in that the bill did not get a hearing, which is disappointing, but we were able to have a conversation based on really sound policy. And at the local level, it can be things like recognizing that ICE is partnering with rogue agents at the DMV. Politicians don't know what they don't know. And if you're not using the information you have to help them shape policy to really protect our immigrant communities, you're doing a disservice. And so I would strongly encourage you to reach out and let them know what trends you're seeing in your cases so that they can shape policy and make changes. Whether you believe it or not, your voice is mighty. And all of you should be really proud that AILA is leading in this space. Through the AILA Justice Project, coalitions are forming, lawyers are leading the fight for immigrant justice. And to those of you who have and will participate in the project, thank you. And I'll end with this. If you agree that the moment is urgent, then ask yourself, what would happen if each of you in this room, and look around, it's a big room, made it a point to do just a little more? It'd be extra work. It'd be a sacrifice. But I really believe it's the most important fights that are the hardest ones, and they're the ones most worth having. I never expected to be in office. I've actually made a career of being behind the scenes. I thought last election day, November 8th, would be my last day in politics, my mic drop moment, if you will. But on November 9th, 
That wasn't an option. I was asked to apply to fill a vacated state senate seat, and here I am. It's a struggle to be across the country from my loving and demanding family. <laughs> but I know the work matters. It was a sacrifice for Trump hotel workers to publicly take on their boss, but they did it. And today they have a union. It was hard for Jose Luis's community to mobilize, but they did it and they won. Sacrifice matters. Immigrants and allies are fighting every day, and they need you to continue to stand with them. Think about this. If every one of you put in 10 hours this year to train volunteers back in your community, that would result in thousands of new hours of efforts being done to fight back against racist and hateful policies. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of what's possible. I've learned this, and I believe it to be true. When people decide to fight, when they decide to struggle for justice, when that light goes on, it's near impossible for it to turn off. It may flicker a little bit, but it doesn't go away. You have the power to transform lives with your experience and with your knowledge. I look around this room and I see the warriors on the front lines for our most vulnerable sisters and brothers, and I am so proud to stand in the fight with you. Thank you for all you do, and have a wonderful rest of your convention.